It is Friday, August 30th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone, to another Vampire episode of LTPS. As always, let's begin with our PS Plus reminder. This is your last call to claim the August PS Plus Essential lineup. Claim those games before they go away. This coming Tuesday on the 3rd, it's going to change over to Harry Potter Quidditch Champions, MLB The Show 24, and Little Nightmares 2, all PS4, PS5. Uh, this lineup, I think, is okay. The problem here is that while it is good to have Quidditch Champions launching right into Essential, that's a day one launch for PS Plus, you know, the kind of property where if you care about it, then great. If not, then it's sort of an immediate write-off, which goes into MLB The Show. I will complain about this every single time this happens. We should not be putting annual sports games on Essential. Sports games are the kind of titles where you either love them and play them and typically buy them every year right when they come out, or if you didn't buy it, it's because you don't care for sports games. They're an immediate write-off, and therefore this is a slot in Essential that is worthless to you. So I can't really get behind that. With that said, Little Nightmares 2, absolute banger. Those games are always super fun uh, and also very creepy and not overly scary or anything like that. I think they're just a, a great game to you know turn the lights off and just have some spooky vibes for the night. So uh, Little Nightmares 2 is a very good pick for Essential. Now, before we get into our main news stories, I just had to mention this real quick because this happened like 30 minutes ago before I filmed this. So <laughs> I'm not sure if this will uh, stick around by the time you're watching this, but Final Fantasy 16 on PSN is now showing up as a part of the PS Plus game catalog and it does work. You can do this on console. It doesn't show up from the mobile app. That's a big caveat right now, but on PlayStation 5, you can download the game with a PS Plus Extra subscription. Uh, download it, launch it, play it, load your save file. It worked for me without having to keep the disc inserted in the console, so it very much does work. Clearly, this is outside of when the catalog would be updated for, we assume, mid-September. That's typically when they do this. Uh, so we're not sure what's going on there. I mean, we're in this spot where the game is going to PC very soon. There's also rumors about an Xbox port finally coming out as well. So if Square is in the spot where they just really want to start taking checks from anywhere, get it on subscription, get it on you know PC and Xbox, if they can you know start doing all these things, they'll probably do them as soon as they can. So I'm sure Sony would be the one to also uh, happily give them uh, another round of cash, or maybe it was already part of the original deal to get the game on extra after you know a certain amount of time so um, in that case if it doesn't work right now maybe that means the game will show up in the next two or so weeks anyway moving on to our first proper news story which is the playstation accessories app now launched on windows uh, which was actually just an update of the existing application where it was only for updating firmware on the dual sense so that like kind of useless to a degree windows application is now primarily for the dual sense edge because that's what this was for so if you have an edge controller on playstation 5 you can now use that on windows and you can get the full suite of features on ps5 on windows where you can start editing and setting up custom profiles adjust the dead zones, sensitivity of the sticks, the triggers, things like that. So you can really get a lot more mileage out of the edge on Windows finally, which was, uh, I think, a long time coming. <clears throat> it's kind of weird that Sony's doing this in a way where it's like all these separate applications now where you've got um, the separate edge, well, they call it accessories, but it's the edge application for now, uh, the PSVR 2 app. We're still wondering when or if they'll ever do their own launcher. It seems like you, you would think down the road you want to just consolidate all these things into one app that can also be this sort of gateway for any sort of PC owners that, let's say they buy an Edge or just a PSVR 2, you want them to be able to launch this app and see all these separate options and sort of advertisements, obviously, for other uh, PlayStation hardware and accessories. I assume that's maybe what they're planning on doing long term, but uh, in the here and now, you can get more mileage out of the Edge on Windows. All right, moving on to some Astrobot news. We are officially one week away from the game coming out. Very exciting stuff. Uh, and we can also say that the press now finally has access to the game. They're playing it right now. And the embargo is set for the 5th. So one day before the game comes out, I believe they just got the codes. That's what we're hearing, which uh, is a little unusual, just in the sense that that's kind of a short window to play the game and then do a write-up or video coverage to meet embargo. Now, obviously, Astrobot is not the kind of game where it's like massive. It's not a Ragnarok or a Horizon, Last of Us. Uh, Sony, in those cases, usually gives those games out like 
a month plus in advance. So that's a lot of time to, you know, thoroughly go at your own pace and, and play the game comfortably. So here, a little unusual, despite Astro even being a shorter game. Not sure if that's really reflective of anything. I'm not really concerned about the game's quality, but just thought that was worth noting. Um, but what we can mention is a very interesting interview that popped up from MinMax, uh, where Ben Hansen was speaking with Team Asobi's creative director, Nicholas Duche, for a 176 rapid fire question interview. So I implore you to watch the whole thing. It was really funny to, to go through and see all those uh, Spitfire questions come out, uh, but we'll cherry pick some of the cool ones out here. So we do have a confirmed number for Team Asobi in terms of how many people are on the team, which is 65. So that's the exact number. And we're also hearing that three or four of them were from the original Ape Escape team as well. So uh, long standing employees from Japan Studio back in the day. Uh, they also want to hear from PC players for anybody that does want a PC release. So if you want that, be vocal. Uh, we again have the number of over 150 VIP bots and cameos. There's also new songs in the game in there that Nicholas says uh, are probably not going to be as catchy as the GPU jungle track. So maybe a bit disappointing there. Uh, and then when Mark Cerny played the game, he put down the controller and said, now this is a game. That was the big headline from this week with Astro is that when Mark Cerny played it, he just <laughs> had this sort of coming of age satisfaction, put the game down, had a Frank Reynolds moment. Now this is a game. So <laughs> that was that was interesting to hear. Very funny. Um, we actually also see the, uh, the the trophy list now published on PSN as well, which some are, are looking at. And the Platinum does say um, something along the lines of like, uh, you know, you've done a great job and we'll see you in Astro's next adventure, which is maybe just a little coy thing to put out. I don't think that necessarily confirms, oh, Astro Bot sequel, it's, it's for sure coming. But, you know, they've obviously been using Astro for a while, so I think we could reasonably see Astro come back, especially if this game does do quite well. Uh, another headline from this week was how Craig is going to make another cameo appearance in the game despite the ABK acquisition and everything which I think is not really a, a huge deal considering you know they, they already got it in there to begin with so depending on the timeline here and I, even with Microsoft being very reciprocal nowadays anyway with shipping on competing platforms I mean I, I don't really think that's as big of a headline as some are making it out to be but uh, there's 150 in there some being very obscure so I can't wait to dive in and play the game I mean I, I I'm not sure if I'll do like a full playthrough upload of it, but I, I'm very much going to record my playthrough and I'll figure out what kind of upload we'll do. Maybe something similar to Astro's Playroom where it's more of a, a Platinum Run style video. So I'll be having a very fun weekend when that game comes out because that's pretty much all I'll be doing. Next up, let's talk about LEGO Horizon Adventures where we still don't have a confirmed release date just yet. But what we do have is PlayStation's homepage updated very briefly to show a November 14th release and then quickly taken down. And this did happen before the Nintendo Indie World and Partner Direct. So at least in that moment, a lot of people thought, okay, maybe Sony's going to be a bit bold here and confirm the release date for a PS Studios game at the Direct because it's getting a Switch version, uh, which that Direct came and went. It did show up during the actual live stream. Um, I don't even think they brought new footage. It was the same trailer from before, but that did not have the release date. So we're not sure what's going on. I guess this ties in more with our next news story. So we'll just go right into that, which is the rumor of an upcoming state of play. And that also kind of folds right into the other thing we talked about just yesterday, which is the PlayStation 5 Pro. Uh, kind of a leak, more of a rumor technically, because this does come from Bill Bukun writing for Deal Labs. They tend to be very accurate because they do this from website backend scrapping, or they can see press materials, marketing materials, PS blog posts. So they claim to have seen the PlayStation 5 Pro final uh, retail box. And that's why they're saying they can confirm, you know, a regular controller with the console. They can confirm the name PS5 Pro, and they can only say what they've seen, which is a digital edition of the console, and also showing off a, you know, sort of crude sketch of what the console does look like, because they have to do it that way. If they publish the actual material, then they are certainly going to be vulnerable to a takedown notice from SIE, which they uh, tend to do, and they have done for PS5 Pro so far with that video from Moore's Law is Dead. So, Again, this kind of all ties in with the State of Play rumor where that was from Giant Bomb's Jeff Grubb during Game Us Mornings uh, discussing the whole Gamescom open secret for PS5 Pro thing and saying he has heard about a State of Play for next month. And he did clarify right there, he was very firm about this. It's a state of play, not a showcase. Also kind of covering his ass saying, let's say it's near the end of the month because people do kind of hound him about, you know, when's the state of play coming, when's it coming? Uh, and he's not gonna know exactly when, but he's just saying for now, 
end of the month. And now it's a lot of speculation on, I guess, all these things that are culminating and we'll, we're just gonna have to wait and see, right? There's really nothing else that can be said outside of what's already been repeated before because we did just talk about that yesterday, which is PS5 Pro is the kind of console where you would think it gets its own live stream, but maybe they would you know, throw it into a state of play and maybe it's just gonna be a very big state of play and maybe the company's not gonna use the showcase terminology anymore. I mean, it's one of those things where it's very hard to predict what they do nowadays. There are certain aspects of like, I guess safe predictions we can do. I mean, there are certain patterns where it's like, okay, they usually do something in September, whether it's a showcase or a state of play. So we can say they're gonna talk eventually and that'll probably be true, but pinning down exactly when they're gonna do things, how they're gonna do it, especially when our only other example for a mid a mid cycle update is PS4 Pro and that was from a, a very different time with the company as well. It's just it's hard to say for certain what's going to end up happening. So, we know they're going to talk about something soon, confirm PS5 Pro and also uh, the Lego Horizon release date among other things. So, there's that. And then also the other obvious elephant in the room here, which is other just sort of brand new announcements, which uh, we are due for, right? Like when Sucker Punch finally going to talk about the Tsushima sequel and various other first party teams, if they're ready to show something or, or tease something, this kind of dials back to what I've tried to analyze before, which it does seem quite apparent that the company's in a place where for a lot of the first party teams and those single player titles where people are really, you know, beating at the door for they want to announce sooner to when they know they feel comfortable about hitting a release window. So I think that's where we're at. They're going to talk very soon, and I think we will have a lot more to say and cover in the next few weeks. All right, let's move on to some very spicy PlayStation rumors, which we should absolutely take with that ever so fine grain of salt. Let's begin with this one. Why not? We haven't had this in a while. A Bloodborne rumor. Yeah, that's right. Bloodborne coming back in some way, shape or form. Uh, this one comes from Daniel RPK. So this name has popped up a few times uh, the past year or so where again, they're like some sort of well-known movie leaker, Marvel leaker. They always pay all this stuff behind their Patreon. So occasionally, they have this stuff with video games as well. So recently they mentioned that there is a new Bloodborne game project uh, that's in development. They're not sure if it's a sequel or a remaster, but that did pop up recently as well. Uh, what I keep hearing with Daniel RPK, because again, I, I don't really follow movies like that, and that's primarily what they do. Their mileage there is like 50-50, so it's like sometimes they do land the stuff, sometimes they don't, but I guess they kind of run with whatever because they do pay wallets. So there's always that sort of I, I guess angle to consider is like, okay, maybe they just try to put stuff up there to encourage more people joining their Patreon. So I, I don't really want to get in the weeds of if that is what's going on. Cause I, again, I don't really know them that well, but Bloodborne, it's, I, I guess one of those things where we always get rumors that pop up very frequently. Uh, at least on this channel, we tend to ignore most of them. Uh, that's a, I guess, semi bigger name. That's now throwing their hat into the ring of Bloodborne being a thing that's in existence. Would Daniel be privy to that? I, I'm inclined to say no, probably not, but I guess we'll see. Moving on to our next rumor about Jason Blundell and the secret team at SIE, where they're not really a secret team because we do know they exist. Uh, this kind of dials back to when Jason left Deviation. Well, this would have been two years ago now at this point, nearly two years ago. Uh, then Deviation had like 90% layoffs uh, shortly after because we then knew that SIE canceled their game with Deviation. Deviation being a new studio, they just lost all their funding, so they had mass layoffs. Then they scaled back up because it seemed like maybe they did find another publishing partner, but eventually they did uh, somewhat recently close. And that's where we heard more and more about Jason Blundell actually being at SIE uh, with JC. And that's kind of how we found out about the whole thing. We don't know for certain exactly how long he's been at SIE, but this goes into the rumor where this is coming from Glitching Queen, a 2K Games creator and Call of Duty content creator where they put out this tweet recently saying that Jason Blundell's new studio at SIE is partnered up with Bungie and it's a, an action game set in a brand new science fantasy universe. Um, now they don't actually clarify that this is say the Gummy Bears project or anything because we did touch on that uh, briefly when the whole Bungie fiasco happened a few weeks ago and that the timeline does not really line up there at least for that particular project. Obviously, SIE did bring on Bungie um, at that point when Jason was, 
Uh, well, that would have been, again, September 2022. Uh, Bungie was properly in-house at that point, but they were still completely independent and operating independently as well. So I guess partnering up, it depends on what that could mean exactly if this is maybe a, a separate project that is still different from the Gummy Bears team because that's what we... Well, that's at least what I think, right? The timeline just simply does not match up with uh, Jason, say, taking on the, the Gummy Bears project. It sounds like that's a completely new thing that happened somewhat recently as a part of you know Bungie's financial term. Uh, turmoil and SIE stepping in, but at least based on the phrasing, I, I guess that's where there, there's some plausibility on like, oh, that's what Jason's up to right now. Although I will say I'm very surprised that this rumor gained so much traction when the source is, you know, somebody that most people probably have not heard of or don't know their track record, and I certainly don't either, so I kind of thought this was not really going to blow up the way that it did. Uh, not to say it got a ton of attention, but um, it's, I guess, plausible if it's more of a, a very ambiguous, oh, he's partnered up with Bungie, and that's kind of all they're saying right now. So we can't pin down any sort of validity to this, uh, especially given this game is likely very far away. But we did have that pop up recently. I would safely expect, though, that this has nothing to do with the separate team that is, uh, you know, the, the Gummy Bears project. That's at least what I feel pretty confident in saying. Now, getting into our next rumor, this one is really blowing up in a way that I was not expecting at all, and that is Black Myth Wukong on PlayStation 5. Did Sony sign some kind of deal for this game or not to make it exclusive? We've had a lot of recent contradicting statements back and forth about, here's what I've heard, I've got a source here, and we can't exactly pin down what happened, but to recap you all on what has played out so far, we had Game Science update on their main site and explain why they're not shipping on Xbox Day One, which was optimizing those versions of the game. Then we had two statements sent to Forbes from Microsoft on two separate occasions where they said the same thing, basically outlining that we can't comment on deals made by our competitors, which more or less says, oh, Sony made some kind of deal, but that doesn't really track with how Sony you know, typically does exclusivity arrangements where they advertise the game, they have marketing rights, they don't necessarily ever hide those things. It's just not how Sony has ever done that ever. So yesterday, we had a report come out from Paul Tassi writing for Forbes, where a source with knowledge of the situation said, it's not a technical issue or some kind of memory leak, because we were hearing that's why the Xbox version was pushed back, but it is indeed some kind of exclusivity deal signed with Sony. Then IGN followed up on this, and they too cite a source corroborating what's been said to Forbes. So again, they think it's some kind of deal. But XDOS 1S, they chimed in, doubling down on their source, saying it's not an exclusivity agreement. Then we also had Giant Bomb's Jeff Grubb recently during Game S Decides. Uh, he said it is also not an agreement that's in place with Sony. Very strange situation playing out where I can't remember a time where it was like this, where there's this back and forth on is there a deal or is there not, when almost always that's never really the issue because we always know if there is one because it's always out there in plain view. Like my thoughts have not really changed on this because I, I can't see how it's not something where what's being said from game science is the reality. Because again, even if, let's say they didn't say that, they never put out that comment about, oh, we're optimizing the Xbox version. You can still just tell in plain view that the argument still holds here. Sony's not treating the game like an exclusive at all, and they're not going to just do that stuff for free. I mean, obviously, they will enjoy the exclusivity if it's some sort of byproduct of, you know, they, they're having problems with the other version. But, you know, we see this with any sort of actual proper agreement where if, you know, that, that'll come with marketing rights. So they'll advertise the game. They'll put it up on their YouTube channel, on the PS blog, always talk about it, have a, a proper marketing cycle and, and make PlayStation banners. And um, you, you'll see it say call, console exclusivity near the end of trailers. You'll have a little asterisk sometimes letting us know when that, that deal actually expires. And it's not even Sony. Nintendo and Microsoft will also make it very clear when they have some kind of deal which is typically also going to be right in front of everybody uh, Microsoft, when they were doing Game Pass deals very frequently, those always barred PS Plus releases. They would never outline that, right? But it's something where that's what would always happen. Uh, it's so strange how Sony tends to always get this like 
again, it's like a reputation of them being the big bad exclusivity monster as if they're constantly signing third party games left and right when they all three of them do it. Microsoft certainly less so this generation, but they've actually had a handful of like smaller titles, I would say, because uh, those do always align with like Game Pass launches as well. But you know, there's a number of like sort of AA style games that have that have shipped on Game Pass first, and there wasn't even a PlayStation release on day one up until like maybe six months to a year after. So, I mean, it, it happens, right? I mean, it's not really a problem per se if Sony even did, but it's just a matter of they didn't do it this time around because there's, there's simply nothing showing that they did it. It would be... Honestly, I'd be very shocked if that was the case, right? Like, let's say the truth comes out, which I don't know how the truth comes out. I mean, they've never been in a position where they have to make some kind of public statement in a way to acknowledge or not acknowledge a, an exclusivity agreement. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a very weird thing all around. I, I will say this though. Sometimes there are arrangements where the Xbox version will not launch in Southeast Asia or Japan. And maybe that's what's happening here, but it still doesn't really explain away why the game did not ship globally. Uh, so I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird. And I think for IGN and Forbes, they only said they had one source. So maybe they're not also trying to double check this to sort of solidify the information. It, it's just, there's a, a process that takes place there to make sure you have the correct info. So it's, the whole thing's very bizarre. I can't remember a time where th this has happened when we have to figure out if the game is exclusive or not, when we have, I guess, enough things in plain view that tell us it's it's not. It was likely a byproduct of game science and them doing console versions and maybe having some issues with the Xbox ones. But I don't know. I guess we'll leave it there. If some kind of truth comes out, which I don't even expect because it's not like we've ever had them have to comment on things like this, but maybe we'll have something to talk about by next week. But if I had to say right now, I would still safely assume there is no agreement. All right, moving on to Firewalks Concord, where I feel like we would be remiss not talking about this on LTPS, um, but it's it's something where I will say, like I was just on the Spawncast talking about this. Uh, me and John did our PlayStation podcast, Click R3. Again, shout out to anybody that didn't know about our show. We're still doing that bi-weekly, and uh, we had a pretty thorough talk about Concord's opening numbers, which so far have been not good, obviously. It peaked on Steam at like, you know, just under 700 concurrent players in the first 24 hours. Uh, then the following days, it just kept nose diving and nose diving. So there's only like less than 100 people at any given time playing on Steam. Um, and those are only Steam numbers in fairness. But even if you multiply the, you know, that Steam number by 10, 20, 30, 100 for PlayStation players, that's still quite bad. So, I mean, this game likely sold a few thousand copies, which for how much money it cost, how long it took to make, um, this was no cheap game to make. I'm seeing some say, oh, well, it's not as big as like a, say, a Naughty Dog or an Insomniac game. And, and certainly certainly that is true to a degree when those studios, especially Naughty Dog, where they're, where they're up to like 400 staff in California. But, you know, this is still 100 plus studio staff, <clears throat> excuse me, in Washington, eight year dev cycle, even if that's something where you're only counting for the six years that Sony stepped in and signed the game on and then acquired the studio. We all know this game is a financial disaster in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so again, I, I've said a lot about the game so far. I feel like we should just put it down for now. It clearly did bad. We will wait and see and watch what happens. Sony will have to do something with the game, which would likely be making it free to play. Uh, I'll just reiterate one point I mentioned on Click R3. Making it free to play is, at this point in the game, not going to save it because what it is fundamentally, the market has already rejected the game. That, you know, the bland characters, the gameplay is just not up to snuff. Again, like it's an inoffensive game. It's not bad by any stretch. It's technically a very sound game made by a, a talented studio, but this was just not the product. It was the, also the wrong time. So making it free to play is not going to help it, I would expect. It has to be something different, like completely different, reskinned, turn it into PVE, I don't know, but it's a matter of what will Sony do to navigate that? Will they bankroll some kind of you know, long-term vision to maybe make the game work or put it down after six months to a year and that's, that's the end of it? I don't know, but we'll keep watching Concord and see what plays out. Now, I will say we have another news story for PlayStation Studios live service failures, and that's for Lucid Games Destruction All-Stars, where this game is apparently 
not really working. I was just recently made aware of this, but the game has been broken since May. So <laughs> I'm only finding out about it. I'm sure a lot of you probably are as well, uh, but I did just check in and it is something where you get an error code when you launch the game, right when you get into the main menu, but then you can get past that and start matchmaking. And then I sat there for like nine, 10 minutes and could not get into a game. But I think that's probably because there is simply no player pool to matchmake with. But I guess what did happen a few months ago is that the game was completely broken and that you got multiple error codes even trying to matchmake. So uh, that is seemingly gone and maybe the game is working now. But the core issue with this game too is that not only is there no new content, so they did commit to a year and now that's that's over, um, but Lucid Games is clearly not maintaining it anymore. They were acquired by some sort of like uh, Tencent subsidiary and I don't know if Sony has like somebody at XDev that's like carefully watching over some of these projects and like barely maintaining the servers, but there are some issues going on. So I guess I'm just putting it out there for anybody that might be uh, more privy to being able to check in on the game and making sure that it does work because you know, shutting it down is, is, I don't want to say fine, but if you're going to do that, then you have to, well, you should be putting out a shutdown notice that's four or five, six months away, ideally far enough away to where people can sort of properly sunset the game and have their time with it, maybe go earn some platinums and, you know, mess around with the game that way. So yeah, it seems like it's been kind of broken as of late. So uh, that's one game that I think a lot of folks did completely forget about and uh, not too surprising if the servers have been broken since May. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Nintendo had their recent Direct where it was an Indie World and Partner Showcase. And uh, as we often do, when there's some kind of bigger live stream from either you know a Gamescom, a Jeff Keighley event, uh, or Xbox or Nintendo, we'll usually recap all the PlayStation relevant announcements. So here's everything from that Direct that is pertinent to you, a PlayStation owner. So for the Indie World portion, we had Bellatro, Friends of Jimbo. Uh, that's for PS4, PS5, available now. There is Neva. We got a confirmed date, October 15th, 2024, PlayStation 5. I'm very excited about this one. Coffee Talk Tokyo, baby. PS4, PS5 coming next year. My God, I love them Coffee Talk games. Very excited to see that. Um, we have the Sea of Stars Throws of the Watchmaker. That's for PS4, PS5 spring next year. Power Wash Simulator Shrek Special Pack for PS4, PS5. That is fall this year. Then there's Morsels that was announced. That's coming to PS5, February 2025. Date everything for PS5. That's also coming October 24th, 2024. So very soon you can start dating objects that turn into humans. Then there's Peglin for PS5. That's coming early 2025. So that's a timed console exclusive for the Switch. And then Cuisineer for PS5. That's coming January 28th, 2025. Then Metal Slug Tactics. Uh, I think that's the same trailer we've seen before. PS4, PS5, Fall 2024. So that one's coming very soon as well. Uh, Tetris Forever PS4, PS5 looks very cool. If you're into Tetris, then this looks amazing, really. Uh, that's coming this year. Uh, Worms Armageddon Anniversary Edition, also PS4, PS5, September 26th, 2024. There is SpongeBob SquarePants, the Patrick Star game. That's coming to, again, PS4 5, October 4th, 2024. A lot of PS4 as well in this because it's Switch, so you know a lot of games that can release on Switch conceivably there's going to be a ps4 version as well um we have capcom fighting collection 2 that one only playstation 4 2025 uh the marvel versus capcom fighting collection arcade classics ps4 september 12th 2024 i know a lot of people are very excited for those uh tellier yumia the alchemist of memories and the envisioned land ps4 ps5 early 2025 and then playstation og fans get hyped we have suikoden 1 and 2 hd remaster ps4 ps5 march 6th 2025 definitely a big deal on that one these suikoden games for any sort of uh, physical game collectors those games are very pricey two is very pricey i should say so Great to see those games come back. You'll love to see it. Dragon Quest 3 HD 2D Remake PS5 coming November 14th, 2024. We have the Castlevania Dominus Collection PlayStation 5 available today. Very excited for that as well. Those Castlevania games were stuck on DS for quite a bit, and it's just great to see them. Uh, great to see them all packaged up for like 25 bucks. Uh, also, Limited Run has the uh, physical on that. Tales of Graces F Remastered PS4, PS5, January 17th, 2025. 
Epic Mickey rebrushed PS4, PS5, September 24th, 2024. Tales of Shire, PS4, PS5, that's holiday this year. And then of course, Lego Horizon Adventures as well. Still holiday 2024. Again, no release date on that one, but that was all the, most of the PlayStation relevant announcements uh, for games that are like brand new coming up because there were a bunch of existing games coming to Switch that were like already on PlayStation. But uh, yeah, a lot of uh, good software. Very happy about Coffee Talk and uh, Suikoden. Man, that one was like, I, that was a, a jaw drop. I'm like, oh my God, Suikoden. That is crazy awesome. Uh, I, I'm still trying to get the physicals for that game, but every time I see it out in the wild, I'm just like, Ugh, I, I don't know, man. Hard to justify. I guess it was good waiting. Um, maybe that will take a decent hit to the uh, PS1 prices. Now, moving on to a very concerning news story about PlayStation 5 in Japan, where Sony is increasing the price of the console and accessories again. This would be the third time since launch where the console is going up in price. So, uh, recently confirmed on the Japanese PlayStation blog, Sony says, and I quote here, given the recent challenging external environment, including the current uh, fluctuations in the global economic situation and the impact it will have on our business, we have reached this decision. So, effective September 2nd, the price of PS5 consoles and accessories are going up. Uh, so for an example, PS5 disc consoles, where they were before 66,980 yen, or about $462 USD, uh, it'll now be 79,980 yen, or about $552. PS5 Digital going from 414 USD to 504 USD. Uh, the DualSense is going up to 11,480 yen or about $79. PS Portal $241. PS VR2 $621. And that sucks. That is absolutely brutal, even though it is because of the current global economy. And really the problem here is Japan, where the yen is like the weakest it's ever been in like 30 something years. It's really low right now. So when you account for inflation, PS5's MSRP back in 2020 was really not that bad at all. It was like the mid to high 300s in USD. So yeah, now they've had to bring it back up to like 500 plus dollars, which it sucks. It really stings, especially for a marketplace where, you know, Japan historically has been moving away from consoles now. So this, <laughs> this is not really going to help. Uh, we are hearing that, you know, on the ground floor in Japan, the consoles are already sold out now because this price goes into effect on the second. So everyone kind of got in while the getting was good. But um, that, that's why the marketplace is so different now, because we, we're, we're never going to see prior console cycles where uh, all three can price down their machines aggressively by year three, four, five. They want to get these things in as many people's hands as possible. But yeah, Japan is, is one marketplace where it's like, yeah, we got to bump this thing back up again because this is like the third time. The other aspect of this, which is, I guess, worth mentioning is Nintendo as well, where they're about to ship new hardware in Japan. I mean, that's a very big market for them. So there's been a lot of discussion on what kind of pricing they're going to have to do for this upcoming hardware, where it's almost surely not going to be $300. It's going to have to be more than what the existing Switch is right now, where they have not priced down that machine since 2017. Like, it's insane, right? Uh, all three of them are dealing with us, but we just know Sony is the quickest one to do something about it. So <laughs> they did it here in Japan. Um, likely they are going to try and avoid increasing the price in other marketplaces where they have a higher volume, that being Europe and North America. So uh, I'm not sure if we can say that's going to happen, but, you know, Yen was really the big problem here. It's been very, very low lately. So that was... <laughs> It stings, and it really does sting, especially seeing it in its home territory. Next up, let's talk about the PlayStation 3 exclusive, Metal Gear Solid 4, where everyone is hoping this game is going to show up in the Volume 2 Anniversary Collection for Metal Gear Solid, and now we've got more very obvious implications that that probably will happen. So uh, recently we've had some press coverage for Metal Gear Solid Delta Snake Eater. And so IGN was speaking with Konami's producer, Noriaki Akamura, and they were teasing volume two where when they were asked about MGS4, they said, and I quote here, we definitely are aware of the situation with MGS4. Unfortunately, we can't say too much at the moment with volume one containing MGS1 through three, dot, 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 you can probably connect the dots. Right now, we are still internally concerned about what we should be doing for the future of the series, so sorry, we can't really reveal anything at the moment, but stay tuned. 
I don't think there's much more that really needs to be said, but what I will add here is that when this does happen, when it's confirmed, the internet is going to have a field day. Headlines left and right, I can already see them. The game stuck on PS3 finally leaves, which, you know, it's it's something where I'll always advocate for games coming to modern platforms, uh, having that, you know, updated availability. Not everybody wants to run out and buy a used PS3 and play it that way or uh, emulate it on PC. But there's always been this sort of sicko mindset I've had where it's like, oh, my beloved PlayStation 3, the game is not stuck there, it's right at home. But yes, it does probably have to leave at some point and probably for the better so it can look much nicer than it ever did on PS3. So when it does happen, I'll be happy for everybody that does finally want to play that game on modern consoles. As long as Konami does take care of it on modern consoles, we can't say they did that gracefully with MGS 1 through 3. Uh, although we are seeing that with Snake Eater, that's turning out to be quite nice from Virtuos. So good to see that's shaping up quite nicely. But yeah, when this is finally confirmed, it's going to be a very big deal. Moving on to our next story, we're a little bit late on this one, but still great news, which is uh, the China Hero and Indie Hero Project are doing quite well because it seems like Sony is going to keep doing it. We've got the Mina Hero Project announced as well. So Middle East, North Africa Hero Project. Uh, submissions are already open, so you can start applying if you live in any of these countries. Uh, that would be Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, or Tunisia. If you're a developer, big or small, one person, working out of your garage, whatever the case is, you can start submitting applications and you could possibly get funding, support, and dev kits from Sony to ship on PlayStation consoles. I love these programs. We're seeing so many cool things and the turnaround seems to be quite fast as well because it only took like four or five months before we saw the first like five games coming out of the India Hero Project. And it's exactly what you'd expect, something that's a little bit more cultural or uh, a slice of life game or something that tells a story that we have not seen in games just yet. I think this is just such a smart play from Sony to go out there and scout talent on a global scale to where you're entering into these developing markets that just have not had the chance to really fund and get these games on consoles. Uh, I still think it would be great to have them also do a South America project as well. And maybe they'll they'll get there at some point, but this is this is great. And because the submission process does turn over pretty quickly, we might see these games within you know half a year, which I, I think is great. And I can't wait to see what comes out of this because I think it's gonna really run the gamut in terms of the kind of experiences we could see. I, I just, I love this stuff, so I wanna see more of it. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or X. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it is so simple. Follow the link down below, enter the Gleam giveaway, and support on this channel. A number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all. And we did a lot recently. Uh, we had a Concord talk on Sunday. Tuesday was a PS5 Pro discussion about 60 FPS and where the console kind of fits in uh, in the marketplace and the announcement being soon. And then yesterday we had the breaking news about, yes, the announcement is soon. Here's a design of the PS5 Pro and, and all that stuff. So if you missed all those details, you can go check that stuff out. Uh, coming up, we might have, again, two conversation topics or maybe just something on Tuesday. Depends on how it works out from my end. But uh, that, I think, is pretty much it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.